Um, we are starting with the program right now. Um, to start our program, we're going to call on Perfumla to open for us with Ngozi Sigenela. Perfumla. We're going to start our program with welcoming remarks um, by the Office of Inclusivity and Change um, as the host of the event, Dr. Cyan Alves. Um, I'd in particular like to welcome and thank um, the Executive Director of Gender Dynamics, Liberty Matesa, as well as official delegates from government. Delegates from other tertiary institutions, including the student body, most welcome, and students and staff and participants who have traveled here today. We welcome you and thank you for being part of this, this landmark moment for the sector. It's really an honor for us as the university to have been asked to host this event um, so that the research from the various institutions could be shared and in essence create change within each institution. So there are two focal points in my welcome address today, and I'll be brief. The first is recognizing the role of this institution and of your institutions in invoking change. The second is understanding what each institution can do to change and support regulations outside of the university, and by this I mean national regulations. The involvement of tertiary institutions in, in establishing new practices for trans and gender diverse students is appropriate and is, and is important because we are not only sites of learning, but we are also sites of unlearning. The knowledge creation within higher education institutions becomes instrumental to introduce change within um, and within the respective academic disciplines. We are aware of the effects that inequality and oppression has on gender and sexually diverse students and our complicitness in this. And the oppression is intersectional in nature. As we know from the 2014 research produced by Jakob Brink from Stellenbosch University, where, gen where diverse communities reported experience of discrimination and gender and sexual based violence. Today we receive more current research, which we are most grateful for, from the University of Pretoria, led by Naledi Panzi and Pierre Bruhard, which identifies the experiences that are directly affecting our trans and gender diverse communities in residences. 
And we are incredibly fortunate to have the growing body of research and the GDX model policy framework to assist us in learning to unlearn and also to dismantle existing barriers to inclusion and institute meaningful changes more quickly. I'm going to move to, to the view of the macro level. 31 out of 48 of the sub-Saharan countries have laws that criminalize gender and sexually diverse people, and four of these countries may institute the death penalty. Today, we acknowledge the severe harm experienced by diverse communities in Kenya and Uganda who face high levels of oppression and persecution. And for our comrades in these countries, we stand in solidarity with you. At a national level, tertiary institutions can be useful advocates to raise awareness about injustice, and this is why we are doing, hosting this platform today. Yesterday marked one year since Robin Mutsumi was found dead in a police station, a few meters away from this building. Deliberate and visible hate crimes against our gender and sexually diverse friends and family continues unabated in South Africa, and these acts of violence are currently being recorded through the Breaking Borders and Binaries documentary series, the series initiated by Lawyers for Human Rights, which exposes systemic exclusion and discrimination of economic migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in South Africa. There are real life and death consequences for gender diverse people whose visas are affected by our own country's new regulations, which will, may result in their return to their countries of origin, where they face prosecution and persecution. This colloquium today invites us as higher education institutions into the conversation and into the call for action. And tertiary institutions can do more to provide pla platforms of awareness and support for the impactful activist work from organizations such as Gender Dynamics, the Scalabrini Center, the Triangle Project, and the Lawyers for Human Rights, to name a few, who continually fight for the rights of vulnerable communities. We really do thank GDX for this opportunity to host this important launch. This model policy framework and for the opportunity to use our academic environments and expertise to, as instruments for change. We stand in solidarity with you today, and I thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayan, for those beautiful words um, and support from the institution. I will now invite our executive director, um, Liberty Matheza, to um, say a few words on behalf of Gender Dynamics. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a little bit dry speak the mic, um, so I hope you'll bear with me as I speak. Um, I'm wearing heels today, and I regret putting them on this morning because my feet are killing me. <laughs> now, so I'll take them off as I'm sitting there. I won't, I won't take them off as I'm standing here. It's just you know, for my um, Wonderful. Yes. Thank you very much. So for us, um, this is a very big moment to be here at the University of Cape Town to know that we are endeavoring to, we are launching the model policy framework um, that speaks to the inclusion of trans and gender diverse persons. Before I start with the introductory remarks, I just want to share a little bit of my... In 2011, in 2012, we, my friends and I, we were faced with a lot of stigma, discrimination and violence. One instance was a, an act, attack in front of the Chris Honey residence, whereby... Thank you. An attack in front of the Chris Hani residence. Now, for those who are students at the University of the Western Cape would know where that residence is. And it was a brutal attack. We reported the matter, the institution didn't respond, and then we went to the media. And what we almost sat with was expulsion for reporting the matter to the media, 
on the basis that we thought the universities could name in the list of Qs. In addition to that, campus um, recreational spaces, going to the barn um, as a recreational space, being a gender non-conforming person at that time, stepping into that space and being met by security and saying, you are using the wrong toilet and you are not, you are not appropriately dressed. I was ridiculed in the male toilet where I was forced to go to because my door was kicked in and I was the laughing stock of everyone in that space. I then ran to the woman's toilet where the security came and wanted me to get out and cis women were barricading the door to not allow them to get access to me. I eventually came out and was pushed up against the, the bathroom or the toilet wall by the security guard, basically reminding me never place like this in our establishment and never come here and never use this facility again. In a lecture hall where you are being singled out, where I was singled out, um, you over there, I don't know if you are a he or she, what are you? That was the environment back then. And in many regards, the environment has shifted, but it has also not shifted. Because our, our people still feel unsafe, unwanted, and disposable within higher education. We didn't have the opportunity to robustly engage around what a policy framework could look like back then, but we certainly have one now. And so it is our responsibility to look at how do we roll this out in a way that does speak to creating more safer campus environment for our community members. So that is just a little bit of a reflection of where we came from and where we are now through my lens. It was indeed organizations like Gender Dynamics and Triangle Project and the Gender Equity Unit at the University of Western Cape that held students like me and carried students like me where there was little to no institutional support further to that. Statistics at this point in time reveals, and this is from two studies, the Botello Batans Biobehavioral Study for Trans Women and the Our Doing All Right study, which is a study, a social study conducted for Eastern, East Africa and Southern Africa. And they reveal that, particularly the Botella by Trans study, reveals that 48% of transgender women have not completed basic education. 52% of transgender women are unemployed. That about 36% of transgender women have sold sex at some point in their lives. And then of course, HIV prevalence can be as high as 63% in some spaces amongst transgender women. Harassment, gender-based violence um, also permeates our life. And that is no coincidence, that is how the system has been structured, how institutions of education both basic and higher education, has been structured to exclude us. And so we recognize that policy and laws regulate belonging, who belongs and who does not. And so a policy stance, whether it is at national level or at institutional level, signals to the environment that there is an obligation that it carries to make sure that it doesn't harm people and create unsafe environment that results in negative developmental outcomes for individuals. In South Africa, regardless of the, the high levels of violence and of course discrimination and stigma we are experiencing, we recognize that because of the enabling legal framework that we have, that we are in a better position than many of our counterparts across this continent. Recently, we know we are aware of what's happening in East Africa with the passing of the anti-gay bill, a legislative backlash, and how that is spilling over from Uganda into Kenya. And so how the best interest of the child and cisgender women's rights are being weaponized at this point in time to undo and reverse LGBTQI plus rights, and particularly for trans and gender diverse persons. 
Higher education is not immune to the effects of the conservative forces that we are faced with. There's a global movement that is dubbed the anti-gender movement, anti-rights movement, that is looking to domesticate itself within global South context through universities, through education systems, weaponizing the rights of the child and cisgender women's rights, to name a few. We need to act swiftly and comprehensively to ensure that we can put forward a response that is resilient and sustainable so that it is impossible to roll back those, the progress made in all facets of life and in this case within institutions of higher learning. We value the relationship, um, to move on colleagues, we value the relationship that we have built up with all of our partners within higher education. And thank you so much, um, Cyan, for the Office for Inclusivity and Change and the University of Cape Town for hosting us. Um, we recognize that our collaboration and partnership was birthed at a crisis moment, in a very challenging moment, where the vice chancellor and a universe and a urologist from University of Pretoria engaged in that Instagram live conversation. Um, and so for us, one of the lessons learned is how do we turn a crisis moment, a challenging moment, into an opportunity for growth. And that is certainly what we've done. And may we have many of those where when we are confronted by challenges um, and crises that we will not fall, but that we will look for the opportunity in it to be able to advance and grow. The model policy framework for us as gender dynamics is part of a bigger and much broader offering in partnership with our higher education um, partners and also partners not necessarily working within higher education. We are working on the scorecard in terms of the self-assessments that, that institutions can do to see how well are they doing in terms of progress for LGBTQI rights within the institution. We are conducting research to that extent. And so we are hoping that we can rely on continued partnership in being able to roll out that work and popularize what we are coming up with. Um, our partnership within higher education um, institutions is a monumental moment for the type of organization that we are as gender dynamics, a civil society organization. And historically, through the colonial lens, there has been this barrier between the academy and the on the hilltop and literally with UCT on the hilltop or on the mountain top. Um, ivory, um, what is, what's the expression? The ivory tower, thanks Simon. <laughs> and everyone else outside of the institution. So this, this partnership symbolizes to us that we are ready to forge deep and meaningful collaboration, partnership that is steep within solidarity to advance progress. We celebrate and we applaud all of you within higher education, from student interest groups, societies, to transformation unit, to gender equity officers, um, to SRCs, academic support staff, administrative staff, as well as our chapter nine institutions that we continuously work with. Um, we applaud you for this wonderful work that you are doing in journeying with us as civil society. Without you, the progress that we are making is not possible. Once again, we would like to just give a shout out and a big thank you to the University of Cape Town for hosting us, although we wanted um, a more senior person also from the institution to be here. It is unfortunate that they are unable to be here, but we are hoping that in future, if we have more spaces like this, that we will see that visibility. And I know that you have been trying, Cyan, um, to be able to mobilize them. Thank you to the speakers, the performers, um, et cetera, for also being part of the program today and for offering your time. Um, and then, of course, thank you to the Gender Dynamics um, team who have put this wonderful event together. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. And from my side, I'm very proud as to in being part of this space. In closing, I want to leave us with this 
very um, overused quote by Nelson Mandela. <laughs> 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 but it, hold, it, 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 it speaks to some level of truth for me and I'm hoping for you as well. Education is indeed the most powerful weapon or tool we can use to change the world. And I think as we are sitting here, we recognize the important role that education institutions play and the role that we play in our individual capacities to champion change. I hope that you enjoy the program and I hope that we will have robust discussions today as we take this great work forward. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will now invite um, Kanyisile Phillips, our Education Advocacy um, Coordinator from General Dynamics, to come and speak on the importance of the, um, the model policy framework. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for each and every partner that made time and allocated some of your, your busy time. Because I know that everyone that we invited um, has backlogs, and including us. And so we are here for a greater purpose, like everybody said. And so thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, I am Kanisila Phillips, the Education Advocacy Officer at Gender Dynamics. And I will be touching on the model policy framework and its purpose. Um, so I firstly would like to say that this policy framework is, of course, um, a framework for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse persons within higher education institutions, uh, specifically within South Africa. Um, and of course, this is not a standalone document. Um, we pride ourselves as an organization on the research. So we have a research backing to the model policy framework. Um, in assessing the situation of trans and gender diverse persons within higher education institutions, um, primarily looking at nine institutions, specifically nine provinces, um, with higher education institutions located within them. Um, and so the overview of my presentation is just to, to highlight a quote from that research study that uh, Gender Dynamics has done, um, and just to see what the community actually says um, and the community's voice um, reflecting in the space. We've got, we, specific, we were very intentional um, about having a panel that is specifically student-led and then of course um, a, a second panel that is uh, able to influence policy or policy makers um, and those who are spearheading transformation and inclusion within higher education. Uh, we'll look at the legal basis for the framework. We'll also look at the challenges that is um, impacting transgender diverse students. Um, and then the purpose and function of the policy framework, we'll look at that. And then an overview of the recommendations provided within the booklet. You can follow if you would like to. We have printed out hard copies for you to, to take with you um, and perhaps even follow as I am doing my presentation. Um, and then just to look at some of the ways that you can possibly get involved. Um, if you are not already involved. Um, and then we'll look at some questions for discussion, but we can also keep that over to um, the question and answer session after the, after the panel, final panel discussion, um, should time not allow us. So this quote, like I said, was taken from the research study that we've done, and this was, a, it was called the, a situational analysis of the lived experiences, the challenges, and needs of transgender um, students within higher education. And the person that we interviewed said, the university context has been a very painful journey. There is an element of trying, so policies are there. Uh, sensitization training is available, but people have their own belief systems, and they are allowed to practice those. Uh, and sometimes that involves having discriminatory beliefs. The policies are there to protect the community, but they are hardly practiced. And so the person just summed that up to say, it's really policies that don't really have teeth. And so hopefully, with your presence here today, we'll be able to give a model policy framework, um, really one of the first of its kind in South Africa, um, the teeth within the institution that you are representing here today. 
So the legal basis for the model policy framework is that it is guided by the laws of the country, but also primarily our constitution, right? Um, and further legislation that supports this, uh, this model policy framework is, of course, the Promotion of Equality and the Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act of 2004. We've got the Alteration of Sex Description and Sex Status Act of 2003, um, also commonly, commonly referred to as Act 49. Um, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about Act 49 and um, our legal work that we are um, championing within South Africa as well, uh, as it pertains to this uh, specific act. Um, then also the Higher Education Act um, 101 of 1997, uh, the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act 3 of 2000, we've got the regulations on the registrations um, and birth and deaths registers of 2014, then we've got um, the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act, uh, 32 of 2007. And then the I Identifications Act of six, um, 68 of 1997. And of course, the Refugees Act, um, 130 of 1998. So this document was drafted with all, consulting all of these policies and all of these laws um, to, you know, give... Um, uh, muscle to this model policy framework. So what are the challenges that trans and gender diverse persons are experiencing within higher education institutions? Liberty beautifully touched on her own personal journey. Of course, there are many trans people in the room, and if you don't believe me, you can just look at the ones that is making, because it's, it's a bit hot, and our, our hormones are not, are not, not gelling well. Um, but this is, uh, just to note that, uh, this is the lowest that the econ can go, um, colleagues. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the, the specific challenges that trans and gender diverse persons are encountering within institutions of higher learning, um, of course, can be improved through remedying internal policy um, and promoting an inclusive environment. And I think Liberty did say that, you know what, sometimes we do have laws and, 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 and policies and guidelines and pro protocols, but very often we find that um, it's really paper-based. And so again, we are speaking around giving this model policy framework teeth today. And so this is why we are here, to promote that model policy framework within your institution, within your context, and of course with um, the influence that you have within your institution. So a few specific institutional challenges uh, which are addressed within the institution um, or the scope of this policy includes administrative procedures, we'll touch on them, educational frameworks, student housing, uh, institutional cultural practices, accessing, um, access to health care, um, facilities, and of course, sporting codes. And I think this model policy framework in and of itself is, um, is coming at an opportune time where uh, the LGBTQ queer community, um, specifically trans and gender diverse communities, are under attack globally. And so this is coming in to support uh, the protection of the community in the South African context. Um, so the intended outcomes of this framework is a coherent, uh, evidence-based and implementable policy for higher education institutions that will effectively address these challenges that trans and gender diverse persons are facing. So it's to regulate the policy development processes within the institution but also to encourage, promote, and ensure an inclusive and integrated approach to policy development within higher education. Um, we often find that trans and gender diverse persons are not specifically catered to as it pertains to policies, right? And then you get the, con the conflation between um, gender identity and sexual orientation, and many institutions make the mistake of conflating the two. Um, and so this is really for, uh, to ensure and to promote um, an inclusive, integrated approach. Uh, it's also uh, institutionalized policy development principles and practices to ensure that, but also to entrench a practice of evidence-based policy making, okay, where we can consult a community before designing a policy. Um, very often we find that communities are not consulted um, however, the institution has good intentions, 
um, of including LGBTQ people, of including gender and sexual minorities. However, we find that at times this is, is, is done through the lens of those who are you know, outsiders of the community that are not necessarily part of the community, and so that can create some sort of um, irregularity. And it's also to guide members uh, of ex executive bodies within higher education institutions on policy development and implementation. So this is really a document that can be consulted. Very often we find that the institution would say, it's so difficult to, to review policy and to go back to a policy. Um, I mean, you can just fall under the, the broader anti-discrimination policy. Um, I mean, there's nothing, there's no harm to that. But we, note, uh, we know what the harm is to that and, and, and how the community experience that broader protection um, on the ground. Um, and then, of course, to clarify policy terminology and distinctions so that there is no confusion or conflation between sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that is just um, an example of what the document is able to do. So who does it apply to? Who does this policy framework really apply to? The policy framework applies to government, to organs of state mandated to develop and implement public policies and legislation. Uh, and this includes uh, including regulations and bylaws which are implemented and applied within the higher education framework. And so the, the framework specifically applies to higher education institutions, including universities and colleges and technicons, um, and of course any other uh, places of learning. So what are the overview of the recommendations that Gender Dynamics has provided in this document? Um, and hopefully you can, you can talk a little bit more about this during our discussion and answer session. Um, legal gender recognition. And as you came in, you would have seen that we had the, the orange portrait. And that was really a project that we, that we did about three years ago. Um, and I'm glad that they never launched it because I, I was like, you know what, let me use it for our <laughs> event. Um, but it was around what does legal gender recognition look like for the community and this was uh, this project was really done in the region it wasn't just based on south africa and so the model policy framework is really um, wanting to support institutions of higher learning to promote a self determination self declaration self -de um, self um, identification based approach to gender recognition within the institution Right? What we're saying is that we don't want the institution to pathologize trans and gender diverse bodies. We don't want you to ask us, can you bring us three letters and then we can amend your student card. We don't, we, we, those days should be gone because the model policy framework is really asking that the institution promote a self-determination approach to gender recognition. Um, and then of course, uh, where individuals uh, is in the process of or has not yet instituted an application to alter their gender markers in terms of Act 49 2003. Remember I said that that is the alteration of sex description and sex status act. Uh, the institution should be able to provide recognition of the names and pronouns the individual requires to be, to be listed within that institution. The institution should also introduce a special administrative pro uh, procedure uh, to allow for applications to be made for gender markers to be changed um, on all enrollment records, including for graduation purposes. Now, Liberty touched on her personal experience. When I look at my personal experience, I have um, amended my gender marker some time ago, years ago. However, my higher education institution qualifications are still on my dead name because it's just that difficult to, to be amended. And then it's costly on top of that, right? And so you have to look at, 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 at what the policy is really asking. It's really for the person on the ground. We were looking at the model policy framework through an intersectional lens to say that we, we are not just being discriminated on the basis of our sexual orientation or our gender identity, but also perhaps based on, on, on our race and perhaps based on our socioeconomic status. Okay? And so we were really considering uh, the community member that doesn't have access at all. Um, and so it's also to create administrative procedures to affirm gender recognition and support transgender students. 
um, but also to have a right to change the gender marker on their identity document. Um, and then to, to have a right to a name change within the institution. Um, and then, of course, uh, the procedure to access a third gender marker option for gender diverse persons and a specific administrative procedures should the process that the, the let's say, the normal process that is being followed, um, that process should be able to be interpreted and amended and, of course, applied to a transgender diverse persons, a person in the higher education institution. Um, some of the specific administrative procedures, um, we said that the, the higher education institution should reform administrative processes, policies and uh, processes to be gender responsive. Uh, this includes creating recognition in the administrative processes for transgender identities and non-binary gender identities. And so here we're speaking around registration forms and online applications for, for, um, for the institution, enrollment processes, student cards, we are speaking around class lists and module registration. Um, me having done um, countless trainings here at UCT and uh, Dr. Simon Pick as well, uh, we, will, we will note that, that that question always comes up, so what must I use if the register, if the register says that name, you know? Um, so you find that there's still that we can't make an exception. It's not necessarily, um, you know, going to serve the purpose of my lecture. Um, and so I think it's really around um, the very, even the first time the person steps into the institution, how is that person being received? Is there an option for that person to say, this is my preferred name? If you need my legal documentation, there's my legal documentation, but this is the name that I would like to be recorded within the institution. Communications, we're talking about the impact of the Protection um, of Personal Information Act, POPIA. Official communications on behalf of the institution and digital communications received from service providers, that that must also be amended to the preferred name of the student. Right, because I remember receiving, when I was at, 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 at my institution, I was at UWC, receiving um, you know, an email and it, and it lists my date name, I would not open that in the library. So I'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> because no. Uh, um, and so I think, I think it's, it's, it's really uh, important that in all aspects of administrative processes, as it pertains to communication, that the preferred name of the student be utilized. Introduction, of, oh sorry, the, the prevention of harassment and discrimination. Here we're saying that the introduction of trans inclusive and gender diverse language concepts um, be taken into disciplinary frameworks and special provisions to address discrimination against trans and gender diverse students. And so here we're talking around date naming, misgendering, bathroom usage, hate speech, and this can be verbal, it can be in writing or through digital social media. Okay, digital or social media. And then we're talking about assault. And so here we're talking around physical and or sexual assault. We are asking that the institution consult this model policy framework to see how best they can assert, um, assist the trans and gender diverse student who has experienced any of these. And I'll unpack it a little bit more. Um, disciplinary processes impacting trans and gender diverse students um, let's look at the policy to include recognition uh, for forms of physical violence, uh, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, sexual assault, and of course, rape. Um, these policies should be uh, pre periodically reviewed by a transformation body. So the, the model policy framework is asking that the institution, because we know that institutions have their own identities, and so really, um, it, it boggles my mind to think that the higher education department <laughs> doesn't really, you know, clamp down and say, but you are not, you know, constitutionally guaranteeing everyone their rights within the space. Um, but this is where we are today, and this is why this model policy framework is of importance. Um, and then, of course, the policy development of institutional disciplinary processes with regards to reporting of crimes. Uh, because, again, we note that when a trans and gender diverse person, even in society, and I would like to, to note that the institution of higher learning, as, as well as a school, is a microcosm of the broader society. 
And so people come from their communities into the institution um, with their own belief systems, right? And very often we find that, that is, those are biases that they, that they show up um, with, with in the institution. And so we need to have a clear structure of how to report a crime that is committed against a trans and gender diverse person, person um, on the basis of their sexual identity or gender identity. In terms of security services, um, the security systems in student housing and accommodation facilities should be gender responsive and inclusive to address security concerns by transgender diverse residents. And Liberty wrote a, um, a beautiful paper some time ago on her experience with, with a group of security um, personnel in the institution when, when, when she was still a, a student at UWC and how violent that, can, that altercation can often be. Um, and so we're asking that security personnel be, sensi uh, be offered sensitization training, um, developing uh, development of guidelines for service providers. We're also asking that security um, policies review, uh, be reviewed to address standard operating procedures for campus policy uh, policing and then complaint processes and disciplinary procedures. I think that is really what we are asking. We are asking that this be codified that we have, that it's not interpreted, that the policy does not get interpreted based on the person's own belief systems. Because that is where we find the problem to be. When we're looking at um, a, a, a trans woman reporting um, a sexual assault to the police, for example, the police does have a standard operating procedure, but most of them don't even know that there is a standard operating procedure. And so very often you find that the person will say, you know what, I what are you? Because my report needs to declare who you are, <laughs> what you are. And so in, in that, we're asking that, that uh, securities be sensitized and that the policy be clear on what the process is for that person. And if that person is not being assisted or that person is being discriminated against while seeking for services, that that person know what to do next. In terms of facilities, and I think this is what we all know about, um, policies and provisions within the disciplinary framework regulating prevention of harassment uh, should be responsive. Um, and so it must provide relief in instances where harassment or discrimination um, occurs. And here we're speaking about uh, gender neutral bathroom facilities should be made accessible. We've got the building today, and I think I was sold on the building because of the, the gender neutral bathroom. Thank you so much to the OIC team. Um, <laughs> uh, I think a minimum of one gender neutral bathroom um, should be made available in all facilities. Uh, the prevention of the use of gendered bathrooms uh, by a trans and gender diverse person may constitute an act of harassment. Very often, Liberty said, you know what? You experience the way, way cisgender women in the bathroom needed to protect Liberty from security outside. Um, and so I think it's, it's really to ask that when this happens, when someone is prevented from using a certain bathroom, on the basis of how they identify their, identi their gender identity or their sexual orientation, that this be noted and coded as an act of harassment. Um, but also forceful evictions of trans and gender diverse persons or students from a gendered bathroom um, facility may constitute an act of unfair discrimination. Okay? And I think that is really important for us to understand because this happens on the daily. This happens all over with every trans and gender diverse student. We've got a beautiful video that we are going to watch and um, you'll be able to hear some more stories. So how can you get involved? I'm almost finished. I can see people are starting to sleep. Um, maybe it was the food that we offered. <laughs> so how can you get involved? Really, it is... Um, no, no, no. This is not how can we get involved. Sorry. This is gender affirming... Gender affirming healthcare services, access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services which are inclusive of trans and gender diverse students, um, and where healthcare services are provided within the facility of, of higher learning, uh, there should be provision for gender affirming healthcare as well. Um, 
And so where it is not possible to provide on-site gender-affirming healthcare services, there should be accessible information directing the transgender adverse person to the nearest public clinic to access gender-affirming healthcare. Um, and of course, to inform that person uh, of the support where that is available. In terms of student housing, we are saying that all student housing and accommodation facilities um, shall develop and amend policies in line with the administrative processes and disciplinary codes which promotes um, in in inclusion and tolerant environments for transgender diverse persons. Um, I think I'm not going to go through all of them because of time constraints, but you have the document in front of you um, for to consult further as it pertains to uh, the rest of the, the model policy framework. So how is it that you can really get involved? Um, submit your handprint onto the model policy banner as a symbol of endorsement um, towards the end of the, of, the, of, of the program. We will use, that is the model policy outline, so we will utilize a nice colourful handprint and you'll put it on there and we will note that you have adopted the model policy framework. Very kindergarten -y, very very primary school -y, but we are creative. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, popularise um, this important tool within your institution. Come on board, ask Gender Dynamics how can we get involved? How is it that we can popularise this um, important policy framework? for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse persons because very often we find that there are people within each institution that has the heart to create change, to create inclusion and to transform that, inst that space, but they perhaps don't have the support. We are here to support. Um, support campus awareness and um, advocacy initiatives with student groups in your own institution. Um, so if you hear there's going to be a march for TDOV, for TDOR, Transgender Day of Visibility, or Transgender Day of Remembrance, um, or even for International Day Against Homophobia, Biophobia, Intersex Phobia, and Transphobia, please do support. Um, reach out, I've, I've, I've touched on that one. And then support, strengthen, promote, and make available research in the fields of human rights, of democracy, gender equality, gender and sexuality. I think that for us is really important. And so if you have written a, a paper, I know that Dr. Fikile um, has listed all of the recent publications in the email. Um, <laughs> amazing. Um, so if you have done any research as it pertains to gender and sexual minorities, and specifically trans and gender diverse persons, please share it with Gender Dynamics. We can, we can also, of course, popularize your research through our website and with our partners. Um, thank you. I think that is me. Thank you so much, Kanye Sile, um, for the presentation on um, the importance of the model policy framework. Um, I will now invite our, um, our keynote speaker. Um, let me read quickly your bio. <laughs> Ilana Leah Redcliffe um, holds a BA, BA Honours, and um, a Master's from Stellenbosch University. A 28-year-old colored transgender woman from Stienberg, um, Cape Town. Rayleigh's professional expertise stems from her work experience in the higher education sector as a, a teaching assistant, co coordinator for incoming and outgoing student exchanges, and e-commerce sector. Rayleigh's research centers trans women and their lived experiences relating to representation, access to medical services, transgender theory in the South African context. The guiding principle, principles facilitating her work aims to demystify the trans experience, produce trans um, literature, and improve access in all spheres of society. Rekleef completed her master's degree, cum laude, and will continue her research through um, PhD at Stellenbosch University. Welcome, Ilana. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Apologies, I'm so nervous, but delighted to be here. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Alana. 
I am a 28-year-old colored trans woman from Stienberg on the Cape Flats. Currently enrolled at Stellenbosch University for my doctoral de degree titled Transing a Trans Woman's Story Beyond Transnormative Life Writing. I am the only trans student in my doctoral cohort. When I applied, I suffered severely from imposter syndrome. I questioned my capabilities and whether I'd be welcomed by the department. I was unconventional. I wanted to be taken seriously. I came with radical ideas that transgressed the traditional research topics um, that they'd always been doing. Currently, I'm employed as a teaching assistant for English 178 at the university. You wouldn't normally expect a hyper-visible colored trans woman who openly shares her experience and transness tutoring first-year students at Stellenbosch, a university that, is, that has a history of expunging queer identities in favor of hegemonic white cis-normativity. But what troubles me most is the direct and violent removal of trans bodies from supposed safe spaces seen below in an excerpt from chapter three, Kept Women, Sex Work in my dissertation, Transphobia in the Classroom. As a colored child, I was always told that education was my way out of the Cape Flats and the poverty associated. On a sunny morning in early spring, I moved from my safe space, a shared housing unit in the inclusive Triple L residences to a classroom that was volatile and unappreciated my contribution. I was doing an honors degree. We were about to start a new module. It was part of the course called Feminist Theories. This course was taught by a colored woman who, to my surprise, <laughs> had specific views on womanhood and what a woman ought to be. I didn't know much about her, but I expected her to conduct her classes like any other lecturer. Because it makes, every time you do... You know, the ones who didn't make a uh, comment or notice of my trans. Okay. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll I'll just put it I was a baby yeah. trans. I just started my medical okay. transition, okay. and I was extremely excited about the new me. Where is it? In the English 178 honors class, most of my fellow classmates were queer, and those who weren't accepted us and participated alongside us. Dr. X, a.k.a. Miss Thang, <laughs> came into the room dressed casually in flowing earthy tones and natural curly brown hair. I thought she'd be okay, but no. She sat down and introduced herself, herself along the lines of, hello everybody, my name is Miss Thang, and I'll be doing feminist theories with you for this module, whilst looking around the room and making direct eye contact with me. She must have known about me. Everybody in the department skin is. Did you hear, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Did you hear? There's a trans girl in the honors group this year. Miss Thang continued her introduction. I have very specific beliefs in womanhood and mothering and what it means to be a woman. I don't believe in being trans and changing pronouns and all that new stuff. Feminist theory is about women, females, still looking directly at me. She was talking to me. This whole turf charade was for me. So I won't be addressing any of that, and my teaching will be specific to the experiences of real women. Everyone had visceral reactions, like yourself. <laughs> um, our faces changed, eyes opened wide, gasping in disbelief, uncomfortably adjusting in our seats. They looked at each other, asking if this was real, then looking at me. I was motionless, fixed to my chair and consumed by my rage, thinking to myself, Heck for decal. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My writing can be comical, sorry. Um, it was disrespectful and dehumanizing. We could not believe that an educator, an intellectual, was being so violent to a student. She erased me. She thought there was no problem with what she had said and how she had said it. She thought she was cool. I have to thank my classmates who stood up for me. I knew there would be chaos and that the department would skin her again. But me, I never went back to that class and I never dealt with her again. My experiences in education were always positive. I was the token queer kid who played teacher's favorite in primary school, then going on to university and fostered relationships with my lecturers. But this was different. 
This was a colored woman who knows what oppression by the patriarchy is, who teaches feminist theory and its importance in society, actively sought to erase and remove me and my contribution to this very important topic. I thought she'd be okay, colored woman to colored woman, you know. She didn't want trans women to be included in her studies. She was set on maintaining a cis-heteronormative guideline that she needed to teach her module. She was a gatekeeper, a turf Macy, trans-exclusionary radical feminist, and she didn't care about being labeled as such. The consequences for her were minuscule. My decision to leave robbed me of an opportunity to learn and vice versa. But feminism can be inclusive. It can be inclusive of the lives and experiences of trans women. Feminism can be intersectional. Feminism can be more than just opposing the patriarchy. Ms. Thang's anti-trans charade actively sanctioned and practiced transphobia in her classroom, directly targeting me. And to this day, I have still not received an apology. A quote by Laverne Cox. To think trans women and trans people in general, sorry, um, show everyone that you can define what it means to be a man or a woman in your own terms. A lot of what feminine, feminism is about is moving outside of roles and moving outside of expectations of who and what you're supposed to be, to be able to live a more authentic life. On the 27th of March, I attended a colloquium hosted by Prof. Dennis Francis that reminded me of the callous and humiliating atmosphere that exists in most cis-heteronormative classrooms. Queer and trans students are often guided away from their difference, shamed and erased for it. The struggles of trans and queer students are not only about discrimination and the lack of appropriate psychomedical health care, but they also include legal, educational, economic, and sociopolitical challenges that all function against the success and vibrancy of trans experiences. As a trans woman, I'm lucky, probably one in a million, particularly who had it easy transitioning. Despite money being my only obstacle, I skipped the need for psychological assessments, started my medical transition the moment I was financially able. In three months, my name was changed. In five months, my gender marker was changed. And I changed all my information at the prospective institutions without hassles or any objections. But this is not the reality for most trans people. For Viv, the difficulty with her university centered around accessing funds, paying off debt, and obtaining her certificate and changing her name. Due to a delay in name change, Avs was forced to graduate using documents with her dead name and the incorrect sex description. She, was, she also overcame a physical assault in broad daylight. Key constantly had to deal with harassment and discrimination from their peers who knew there were no cons consequences for their action. For Brad, it, is, it was the difficulty of living visibly queer in a single sex residence that did not align with his self-assigned identity. Sorry. Rue had to contend with pushbacks for those in power over the use of pronouns. For Phil, it was the constant degradation from their peers always being looked at as less, especially as a feminine queer. No, Noah. <laughs> had uh, difficulty coming out to other students and were often misgendered even though they had introduced themselves and walked under a veil of silence about their queerness. Institutions, systems and their stakeholders can play a vital role in the advancement of trans acceptance and integration. Instead, policy it's in, and its implementation does not reflect the realities of trans students at higher education institutes. Even though my master's research focused on representation, I found that trans individuals should be included from the onset of any policy creation that directly affects us. This will ensure the inclusion of trans individuals in every phase of the higher education journey, journey from recruitment to university applications, course and residence placements. Those who hold positions of power to delegitimize discrimination and transphobia in any context, but often they choose not to. 
institutions of higher learning have the responsibility to ensure that students are able to learn, that classrooms are safe, and that there are consequences for actions that go against university policy. Lenning, Brightman, and Buist remind us that sanctioned hatred and discrimination can influence the rise of extreme threats, both intimate and institutional, directed towards transgender students. Comprehensive courses that cover LGBTQ content and issues should be incorporated to normalize queerness and educate those who aren't a part of the community. Most university courses are shaped around and taught according to the gender binary that excludes queer and trans experiences. Queer students should be guided towards understanding themselves the same way that cis heterosexual students are taught about themselves. So moving towards an inclusive and safe environment, facilitating change would require setting clear standards and guiding principles that feature in all policy making. There should be defined roles and responsibilities for every stakeholder. LGBTQ plus policy should be incorporated and implemented at every level and there should be a clear way to measure the effectiveness of such policies. Gender dynamics through their policy reaches almost every aspect of a trans university experience, addressing administrative, educational, student housing, healthcare, cultural practice, and even challenges in sports. This is a policy that every institution in South Africa should take note of, learn from, and implement the moment it is finalized. The best policies emerge when they listen to people who will be impacted the most. By doing this, you can expect consistency from all parties, compliance and effective decision making. I know that if we had different tools at our disposal, we would not need to show our humanity over and over to get things right. For it is through education that we find ourselves. It liberates us, frees us from the shackles of a world bound by itself. Yet it is only through education that we can change the world. In closing, my message to all queer and trans students is to keep fighting, thrive in the face of adversity, take up space and be bold and to never give up because we were all meant to be here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so nervous. Powerful. Um, contribution. And now we're going to have a research report presentation um, by, or titled, um, Always on the Edge by Naled Mbaza and Pierre Boant. They're from the Center of Human Rights, um, SOGES Unit um, at the University of Pretoria. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today um, and for the opportunity and for the opportunity to share on I guess the call for research and education um, on the spaces um, in the higher education space. Um, so I'm hoping that how much time do I got? I'm hoping that I can share a little bit um, on the preliminary report um, that we conducted and hopefully right at the end with the questions we can engage. So the title of my, oh sorry, I'm a junior researcher <laughs> at the Center for Sexualities, AIDS and Gender, as you can see on the screen. I'm also an LGBTIQ officer. My positionality, I am a black woman, I am cis and I am a bi person. So um, I do recognize my positionality in this space and um, my entry into the work that I'm doing was through empathy and I really appreciate and respect um, our previous speakers for sharing their insights, um, their personal experiences. And I think that's one of the ways that we can enter these conversations. I started in the HIV space and that opened up boring, but you know, I started in the HIV space and I found myself really engaging with some of the discrimination that um, trans and gender diverse persons face. So this is the report, it's very long, well, not the report, this is the presentation and I'll reflect on the report um, as I go along. Let's begin. Um, so the overview of the research was, um, I'll just give you, that's what you need to see in order to understand um, and keep on track with how we're going to structure this presentation. I'm going to give you the background and rationale. Um, I'll reflect a bit on the research process and you'll understand it's very in-house admin. <laughs> 
it's very in-house admin and a lot of people have heard me share about this um, and you'll understand as I go along uh, because this research was um, the baby of um, a community of practice on sexual and gender bias violence which has quite a few universities um, on it and I think Charlene could correct me, I think we've got only one university that's missing, I always forget which one, but it's a really powerful space to engage with transformation officers, um, people that are at the front and are usually points of contact for discrimination um, and people like myself that I guess we're using the word baby, that are babies in this <laughs> inclusivity space. So um, yeah, so that's how I'm hoping that I can engage and if I do run out of time, um, I will share the reports with everyone and we can really engage. I can also share the report that we worked on, which I'm really, um, I'm really honored and excited to be a, being a part of. So that's the research team. Um, Pierre didn't abscond, he's on leave, and we forced him to go on leave. He's our um, acting director, and he's really instrumental because he's got multiple years of experience dealing with, again, HIV, um, sexual and gender minorities, um, as well as, um, yeah, so because of the Center for Sexuality, AIDS and Gender. So that's definitely his space. He's very popular. He's a qualified psychologist, and he really brings a tenor um, to this research that we do that's invaluable. We've also got our research manager, Christy Kruger, at the CSANG, which is the mouthful that I shared I identify with. Um, so that's the research team. And this is what the research report looks like. It was meant to be a snapshot. Um, so I, I think it really does um, feed into the model policy framework that we've been honored to be invited to um, join the launch and to actually engage with. And thank you so much, Kanye, for really giving us um, an in-depth um, and also referring, referring to the legal parameters, the foundations that the model policy framework has. So this is what the report looks like. It's a standard introduction, background, research design and methodology. And then what we did is we put I want to say evocative quotes, but they really sort of set the tone for the analysis that we do to show um, just how the participants engaged. Um, and then we have conclusion and recommendations, which I will touch on, as well as, can you mention the models policy framework has got helpful resources and helpful terms, GDX made it. So um, yeah, you'll see that at the end. So background of the research. It's on the screen, but it's basically what I've already said. Brainchild of the community of practice in 2021. I actually wasn't meant to be part of it. I was doing something separate, They're like, we know something. And then I jumped on, and I was really honored to sort of unpack it. Um, and sorry, I didn't mention, the report is called, and thank you for our lovely host um, and, and, and our MC. It's called Always on the Edge, Universities, Space, and Gender. And this was, we're calling it a preliminary report because that's what it is. It's not exhaustive. It's not reflective of all different universities. We did only have five universities that participated. And part of it is not because they didn't want to be engaged. We all know it's tough work and there's a lot on our plates, right? Um, but we did do ethics for about 11 of the 21 institutions that were involved. So there was an interest, but in some cases there were blockages and barriers for people to participate, which is something I'm going to share on because I think we already have a call to do more research, to use education, to engage with everyone at this level and use our influence in order to support the change, the action that needs to happen in the higher education space. So that's something that's important that I wanted to touch on because it was a deep chat and it's very important to be realistic about how do we make this work, whether you're an academic, whether you hashtag PhD with cum laude, <laughs> we're <laughs> prophesying on that, um, and, and whether you are engaging as an activist, which is really where all the juicy, well, I don't mean to take away from the experiences of harm and violence, but that's where the juicy stuff is. And the people advancing this work are really um, organizations like GDX, like the Triangle Project, and, just, and universities as well, um, that work with these activists to create practical solutions to the issues we've already been sensitized to and experienced for the most part. So I have videos on here, but because the slides are going to be shown, um, it's basically a video uh, that feeds into rationale of the study. So we didn't just go resident systems and jump on it. It was a, we do have initiatives that happen on campus. We have students that will approach us and say, listen, it's not happening, you know, you need to do more, you know. So for an example, at the center, and I've got a project manager, Huri, here, 
Um, we are very limited in what we give. We do HIV testing and counseling. We do trainings, something called the nine week entry level training under the Just Leaders Project. But students will be like, we also want prep. We also want um, ARVs. We also want you to give us binders. Um, we also want you to just create an HIV support group. So it's quite a lot, but we do have rationale here that sort of informs the research that we do. And it's very integral because Policies like the trans protocol were developed, and I'm so glad it's meant to be, like you said earlier, it's meant to be inclusive, and at the design stage, it needs to include members of the trans and gender diversity community, so that it's not arbitrary. So I'm just trying to create that visibility, that awareness, that definitely, again, reiterating with my small baby voice, um, just why it's important at the conceptualization part, right? So I'm going to read this out because it's important so we understand, again, to reiterate where did the research come from. We t it was a snapshot, so that's very important because just because you interviewed five higher education institutions, we can't generalize that. But it did give us awareness into the context that we're working on, and we unpacked so much. And what we hope to do, and you can read while I'm speaking, what we hope to do is to basically understand what the context was and what are some of the challenges and successes for resident systems specifically, right? And we all know, um, we might be aware that when you do research, you've got the dream. I don't know if you've seen that picture. It's that delicious shading of the horse and it becomes small and then it's stick figure at the end. So I think it was very great for us to focus on the race system because we identified that there's actually challenges in that space. And Kanye did mention, you've got configuration of residences, you've got the issue of bathrooms and all the different issues that come up when you're looking at the resident system, which some people in the room might have experienced or be aware of. So that's what we were trying to assess. Um, but you know, in, instead of understanding the needs of trans and gender diverse students, what we ended up fight, finding actually were the needs of the people that are addressing these harms and are coming across the discrimination. So again, the research is a snapshot. I'm just doing the final, the final bullet, um, but reflects common experiences. So even though it's not generalizable, it does give us an insight into um, some of the challenges and, and yeah. So that's the research timeline. I only put it here so you know who we were serious. We got ethics. We recruited in our team. We reached out. People are like, get more ethics, right? Just because we grant, we got granted ethics from 11 of the 21 institutions doesn't mean we didn't try like five or six other institutions that really had blockages. And I'll share later about a tip that I can give you to make sure that you can sort of streamline any efforts to do research in the higher education space. So because I'm sharing the slides, but the point is we were real serious about this research. And then the stage we're in, if we can just go towards the end, December 2022, um, was when we actually finished the report and we shared it with the participants, which is important because you can't just be like, this is what we found out, Whew, gone. So we had anonymized the university just so that it doesn't feel like an attack and just so that the participants felt, shared or felt as if they were reflecting on the real issues and not trying to do a PR for the universities. So the reports were shared um, with the community of practice earlier this year, and that's when Cheyenne, I can't see her, Cheyenne then invited us and shared that we've got this colloquium, um, and she really hoped that we'd share this report on this platform. I'm going to skip all the way to the content now. Um, oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to tell you about the gatekeeper that I just <laughs> mentioned. So this is like the holy grail of trying to bypass doing ethics multiple times to do a project in the higher education space. I put DUT not because they were part of our study, because they impressed me so much. I was like, hello, hi, I want to do this research. And you'd expect that for KZN, um, we know that that province has got a lot of <laughs> issues. And I'm from Umlazi, so I mean, I'm very much aware of the realities of, you think DUT, but... The, the truth is they were on point. They were like, okay, cool. The dean of institutional culture is going to look at this. And they did. It took less than two weeks and they gave ethics. But there were other barriers and I can't say that they weren't part of the research process. So this is what it looks like. You usually submit your ethics, they assess your proposal, and then they're okay. So always just try that way before they ask you to do the 30-page, 20-page call the thread with like six million people that are not sure how to make you, you know, into the space. So again, I've just touched on that. It's just about the research process um, and in-house admin about how we um, had a few barriers to help us realize the project. 
All right, cool. So I, I'm giving you an appetizer about not all the themes. I think there's about six or seven themes in the entire report, but I wanted to touch on some that relate to the model policy framework that we have been unpacking today. So um, I'm going to start with the general feedback, sorry. So basically, I think you don't even need to be part of the study. You need, don't need to have done the research for a year to know that, excuse me, the reality is sobering. We've got very, I'm going to say disgusting, just to be evocative, we've got disgusting, discriminatory, violent, painful things that are happening to members of the trans and gender diverse community in university spaces, but even more so in residences. So across the board, that was something that the participants shared. Um, so your, LG, your LGBT officers, transformation office, people working in transformation and inclusion offices, and they were identifying that, one, we've got gaps not only in the formal processes, but we don't have support structures that are competent and practical for the inclusivity of TGD students in residences. The two themes that I wanted to unpack here, I'm sure that you're reading as well as I go along, the important part in this slide is what we call the theme. We've got the policy frameworks and opportunities and limitations, and I picked that on purpose because we're unpacking a framework today, and then also the residence configuration, which is also an element in the model policy framework. So, you can just read some of the questions, and I'll be very honest to say, we wanted answers from these participants, but we got even more questions. And these are some of the questions in the process that we asked ourselves, but also they were asking as well, how do we do this? And that was important. I put the questions up there, or we decided as a team to put those questions up there, because they really just show us a deeper engagement. So I'm just going to look over here. Can I please just skip if possible? Oh, I can still use that. Cool. And then the residence for configurations, the same questions. I think one that stuck with me is there's some situations or institutions that are proud of their gender neutral residences, co ed, etc., etc. But all they're talking about is the three floors, whether it be so for the male students, the bottom floors. And what does that mean? You know, what does that actually mean? Is that what we mean by inclusivity? Right? Because it's still gender binaries being reinforced. It's still cis heteronormative um, principles. And how does a single room approach happen? Because we even know without this research specifically that people end up being put in single rooms when there's a complaint, for an example, and the mm. system will side with the cis het student. What does this mean for trans and gender diverse persons? Is that inclusivity? So these are all some of the sobering questions that we had to ask ourselves. Um, and I say us because the process is collaborative. So I did, and the team also did engage actively with knowing that we're in this space, whether you're a junior researcher, baby researcher, whether you are an LGBT officer trying your hardest to make sure that um, we're challenging the systems, not only in the higher education space, but when you're a tutor, when you are a lecturer, which are experiences that I've gone through, um, it's still a generalizable experience and you, it's important to still reflect on how you are involved in the process of doing this. So these are the conclusion remediate recommendations. Um, it's Friday, so the English is expired. I'm trying my best, y'all. Um, so I'm just going to do the bullet points, and I think we're at the end of the presentation. So some of our recommendations where we want to gain or bring expertise on gender diversity and, ex and, ex and expression and ensure that TGD voices are central to the process. So that's something I think we can give a hot tick that we did, right? Because we're engaging with, um, I guess, our previous experiences going into the research. They were founded on the trans protocol. They were founded on conversations and the working groups that are, in the, that are in the community of practice. So, and with people that are working actively with um, the official university career organization. So that's something that's important that sort of gives us a hot tick, you know, but there's always more that can be done. I'm just going to pick a few, and you can just read for yourself. I'm sorry, I'm going to be that lecturer who goes boop, 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 because I'm going to give you the slides. I'm not going to, like, colonize them. <laughs> so I'm going to skip to, um, it's important, right at the bottom. So if you're taking notes, wow, awkward. So we're going to, we, we really, um, some of our recommendations were conducting a review of reporting processes, um, which, reply, re, which requires reflectivity of the institution to say we know we're not doing all we can but you do still need to reflect on the processes and assess if they're TGD friendly. Earlier, we've also got speakers that are reflecting on the importance of not just conflating the issues of the LGBTQIA plus community, but also making specific arrangements for the specific challenges that the TGD um, persons face um, generally. 
So, and that's something that came up. We conflate the entire community and people that are making um, policies with liberty in the ivory tower, they think, yeah, we're doing a great job. We'll just sleep it there, you know, <laughs> under the anti-harassment, anti-discrimination policies. But there is an important need because for us that are doing the work, it's important to have processes to follow because they lead to repercussions. And it's not to be punitive, it's just to create conversation and sensitization as well as visibility. So that's just the few I'm going to pick. It's tough. We face a lot of issues in our office. It, on an ad hoc basis, our acting director ends up being the person to deal um, or address or help or offer a duty of care initiative for students that are misplaced in residences. So it doesn't mean when you have the policy in place, do the trainings. I think between um, our office and the Transformation Office and the Center for Human Rights, I, I, I think more than 20 trainings altogether in two weeks, I'm kidding. <laughs> so um, that's something I just wanted to share. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. So another me. round of applause, please. So um, we were supposed to have a message of support from Honorable Nombumelelo Tobile Mkwacha, the MPN Chairperson of Higher Education Science and Innovation Committee, um, who apologized they cannot be here today. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Mamelo Matthews, legal officer um, for the Western Cape um, at Commission for Gender, University of Western Cape, I assume, um, Commission of Gender Equality. Good afternoon to everyone in the, in the room. Um, such an honor to be here and to be part of this launch. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Mamelo Matthews. I'm the legal officer for the Commission for Gender Equality. So it's a chapter nine institution. I'm not from the university, but I am an alum. <laughs> I did study at UWC. No, no, don't worry about it. I did study at the university. Um, when we received this invitation to be a part of this launch, I was really excited for many, many reasons. Um, and in particular, in relation to the work we do at the CGE and what we are mandated to do in terms of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people are familiar with um, Chapter 9 organizations. Can I just get a show of hands? Um, okay. All the students. All the students. That's right. Well, um, so Chapter 9 institutions are ourselves, the Commission for Gender Equality, the South African Human Rights Commission, the Public Protector, the IEC, I'm missing one, CRL, Cultural Linguistics, um, and the, the Commission for Cultural Linguistics Rights. Um, so I think there's, there should be five. I can't, don't know if I mentioned all five. But we are mandated in terms of the Constitution to promote human rights. Um, within our various capacities. So, as you know, the P Office of the Public Protector, they um, are there to protect your administrative rights. So if you have rights that have been violated in terms of poor service delivery, you would lodge a complaint with them and they would investigate. So, for example, if you are <coughs> having an issue with changing your gender markers at um, home affairs and the process is just unjustly long and it's affecting your life. In terms of lack of service delivery, they would intervene there. But in, from a gender element, the CGE would intervene. Um, and we would work together in doing an investigation. So with the Human Rights Commission, they, because their mandate is so broad, a lot of their work, whether they will make an assessment as to who or which institution is best suited to investigate the violation. So if it's a gender complaint, they would refer it to ourselves. Um, I am one of nine legal officers, so we have a legal officer for every province. So I am responsible for all investigations within this province, but we also work nationally. So we work together as a team to tackle um, national problems. So before I get into all of that, 
or as a segue into, all, into what I'm actually here to discuss um, and how what we're discussing today and what we plan on doing moving forward ourselves, Gender Dynamics and, and the CGE, as well as all other institutions in the room. I want to show you how the CGE could fit in. So as the CGE, our mandate is to, in terms of chapter nine, is to um, promote, protect, and monitor as well as evaluate gender equality. And we do this through research. So we have our research unit. Um, public education, our PEI unit, they go out and do the advocacy work and the education work. Um, policy development, legislative initiatives, and then monitoring and legislation or litigation. That is mainly done by legal. Um, we also do, from our PLU, our parliamentary liaison unit, we make submissions um, in terms of legislation. And a lot of the the stories and the presentations have highlighted things that we have also noticed in our ivory tower. <laughs> when we look at legislation that is going to be passed through at Parliament, um, we always look at, is this transformative? Does it include everyone? Is it gender neutral? Are we still going he, she? Um, how, how does it affect the person on, on the street, the everyday you and me, because a lot of, it, when you, a lot of the time, or all the time, when you read legislation, it's very romantic. Mm -hmm. And then you sit and you ask yourself, but how is this going to work practically? Mm -hmm. So that's where we come in. And that is why I'm also so excited to be at this launch, because I'm looking at this wonderful document that you've created. Yeah. And it feeds us to also understand um, how we should be what kind of lens we also, so we should be wearing multiple lenses when looking at legislation and making submissions. Because the truth of the matter is, is when the CGE makes a submission, it holds water. So it's important for us to be very educated as to what it means for the everyday person. Mm. And that is why I'm excited to be here. Then we have our transformation hearings. And we are current, I just, before arriving, we had a meeting as legal as to what our plan for the new year is in terms of transformation hearings. So our transformation hearings that we take um, various sectors. So one, one financial year, it was higher education. And um, the investigation was to see whether higher education was indeed transformative. But that was years ago. So the issues that we had then were addressed. But now we have new issues. We have more, new problems. So now with this document, I can go back and say, guys, but have they really transformed when we look at the inclusion of trans and gender diverse persons? Have they, what, is it, what does it mean? Because before it was male and female, women need to move up in the ranks, we need to look at color, but now we need to look at a wider spectrum. We've excluded an entire population of persons. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is really important because now we have a new way of looking at what our transformation hearings can mean going forward. What are we going to look for? What are we going to assess in terms of policies? Where are the gaps? And it's this document that feeds us and that helps us understand the gaps that we would not have seen as, uh, um, you know, as the CGE. What gaps have we missed? What are the new developments? Because we can't be on top of everything all the time. It's not possible. That's why we need partnerships. So as a, a word of encouragement or message of support, there's a lot of work for us to be done mm -hmm. that can be done together, all of us, the CGE, Gender Dynamics, and everyone in this room. There are opportunities, and I'm excited about it because we're looking at transformation also in the health sector. And like your policy framework points out, there are gaps, and that can help us feed into closing the gaps. So not to be long or anything, but the point I'm trying to make is that the importance is clear. And if you are willing to work with us as the CGE, I honestly see that there's, we could do a lot of good work. And also getting the policy to be implemented because we then have to review policies. So we will use yours as a framework to see whether those policies are. Yes. 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 We don't. You know, like I said, I don't 
know everything, my colleagues don't know everything, but now we've got this toolkit mm. that we can use and make sure that what you've highlighted in your, in your policy yeah. actually reflects in the workplace, in the health sector, when we do our transformation hearings. Mm. Thank you. later in life, uh, during my undergrad BSc, that I actually had multiple personalities or multiple ego states. So when I discovered that they, them exist, it was the most obvious decision for us. Um, yeah, that is the short and sweet of it. Um, nothing deeper than that. Some of the personalities are identified exclusively as female, some of them exclusively as male, and some of them very fluid in between. So, yeah, it's been a journey. Currently, we just express as masculine. Um, as a young child, we were very feminine, very the culture, chubby, feminine boy. <laughs> so, yeah, exploring new worlds. Thank you. Um, so, as much as you know, we're going to talk about this. So, <laughs> 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 you're yeah. all learning. Oh, um, I don't have much of a no, pronoun journey. Um, I don't know My journey in the is my sexual orientation. Um, I identify as queer, um, and that was something that was never, I was never to be straight in my life. Um, and it, but there was never a word for it. And the older I got, the more I realized that there are no boundaries into what I liked. Um, I didn't have a specific desire to be with someone Clear. who was male, or <laughs> someone who was female. I just liked what I liked. And for like a while, I, I identified as bisexual, which worked for me because I was like, you know, both, both genders. And then as I got older and wider, I realized that I don't like the label. I don't like being confined to that. I don't like being defined by other people because I felt like other people saw me as, as bisexual and I didn't I like that. So now I, I just identify as queer and I think that that's cool. Gosh. That's an important part of my journey and something that I like to instill um, in the students who in my community is that you should really feel defined by anyone else and you shouldn't feel the need to fit into that box, you know? We're so we're so often like put under the pressure to fit into a box, especially in a tertiary institution. Um, you know, you have to identify a certain race, you have to identify a certain sex, you have to have certain sexual orientation to be uh, accepted. And, yeah, so the older I got, the more my journey <coughs> Being queer and just being queer and not being able to explain that to anyone. That was just what it was for me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello, guys. My voice is a little bit deep. Um, <laughs> as um, the moderator just said, um, my pronouns are them, they. Um, I grew up, um, I just came to, when I came to university, that's where I started saying them, they. Because I understand it's part of the stigmatization and bringing knowledge to people who don't know um, pronouns. So when I'm when I'm saying um, them day, it's part of it's part of education that when they approach people that they don't really know, they must gender other people. Um, I'm a queer 
Um, can we get back to this one? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we mentioned before, my name is Liana Aliana Mantikizela. Um, also, I will be able to. Um, my pronouns are Dengda. Uh, my pronouns Jenny began in high school. I was very angered by being called he, him. And I was very angered by being boxed in the boy um, aspect of schooling. And that's when I realized that there was something different about me. But you know, I didn't know how to define it because there was the gap in the comprehensive sexuality education, in our education system, and we were not exposed as to who we are. Um, as mentioned earlier on, is that we are always taught in the cis-heteronormative practices, and there was this gap that needed to be filled. Um, then that's when I got to fill that gap in university, when I was introduced to the BU initiative of the SRC. Um, they introduced this hon honorific um, title, as some people mentioned, it's called MX. And when I learned about that and exposed to it, I realized, no man, this is what I've been looking for. Because in my life today, you might see me boyish, tomorrow oh, I can be really gaddish. <laughs> I explore my life in various ways, which is why I also ended up in drag. Um, so my pronouns are they, then that's quite my journey in simple terms. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jay. Uh, my pronouns are, oh, sorry. my pronouns are she, no, okay. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and so I haven't really had much of a exploration journey around that. Um, in terms of my sexuality, I identify as a lesbian. Um, I've been very fortunate to not have um, any major issues around that. But in realizing that, I know that my voice is very important to be given to others and to advocate for others where um, they might not have their voice heard. So that's what I try to do. What does your student community that you serve look like? How? Yeah, how engaging are they? Um, what are their needs? What do they want to experience? Um, how difficult is it to actually gauge what the, the community needs? And then bouncing off that to f kind of end off the session for us is how do you then go about serving the trans, the queer, the gender diverse students in your community? So from Spectrum side, essentially, I forgot what I said, so I'm going to just read it again. Um, okay, our community is super difficult to engage with because we all burnt out. And when people have energy, it's you'll have like 10% of the community at any time with enough energy to actually participate and do stuff. The rest of the time, people are either depressed or they are just getting out of their depression or they are not quite sure what the hell is going on. So. <laughs> It's a very difficult community to serve. Um, in the past, we used to focus on social interactions and social engagement stuff. Um, but now we've shifted the focus because we are basically the only student um, society on a medical campus. We focus now on healthcare. So our first um, term is focused on sexual health and wellness. Second term is anti GBV health um, healthcare, and then the third term is trans and gender diverse healthcare. So, <coughs> organizing talks and workshop sessions to draw students in and get students to engage on that, while also keeping our Pride Week event that is more towards the end of the year. And yeah, that is our main focus at the moment. Um, on campus, we are not aware of any trans students, which does not mean that they do not exist. Mm. But um, from what I've heard from other previous student leaders and from the older students, there are not openly trans students on campus. So a lot of students are trying to fight for that population to make it more inclusive, to make it more welcoming. Um, and that is where the work is focused on. But in terms of knowing, actually being able to speak to a student on the campus and being like, what is your experience? What do you need from us? It's not really possible. Um, yeah, but we want to break that down and we want to, we are working to make it more inclusive. And we are looking forward to also presenting the gender dynamics policy framework to our gender equality unit to that end. Yes. Um, okay, so right off the bat, my student community that I serve is white and straight. Um, <laughs> but there is that, that little 50% um, that is diverse. 
and that have a multitude of issues that need to be addressed. And I think I find it not so difficult to know what my, my weight community needs because I've always found myself surrounded by the queers. Like, ever since I was a kid, this is all my friends have always been queer to some extent. Um, so these are things that are really close to my heart and something I'm, I'm really, I really, as soon as I hear a story from a student, I immediately want to run into it and make it a massive project. Um, the reason, so, so to answer your question, the reason um, Breaking the Binary became the theme for Wake this year was because a friend of mine um, wasn't, is, um, is a non-binary student and they were subject to placement in a female private student organization. So Stellenbosch has PSOs for students who don't live in a university residence. And so they were placed into this, this PSO and they thrived, you know, they really, they presented as femme and they really felt like that was somewhere that they could, you know, enjoy it. Um, and then they got to their final year and they ran for leadership. And the person in charge of elections at the time told them that they could not run for prim or head of the, the PSO because they don't embody the feminist ideals of the PSO. Despite the three years that they spent in the PSO, despite the, the fact that they had won them the a cappella title, um, the fact, despite the fact that they had been an active member in that organization, they were denied it because they were non-binary. And so it's clear that on my campus, one of the major issues my students face is just their lack of ability to be included. And it doesn't just happen on a sexual orientation or a gender orientation perspective. It happens in terms of race as well. Um, and you know, part of our community, we always embrace intersectionality and that's something that I have to address in my portfolio as well. And um, so yeah, that's, that's a major issue. Um, we also find that a lot of our students need assistance or need advocacy when it comes to GBV. Um, the university doesn't really take that seriously and I've dealt with mainly um, <coughs> cis male and cis female cases but I can only imagine the, the non-gender conforming cases or the trans cases that aren't coming to light and I think the reason I'm in this position is because my heart genuinely does break for the students who, who aren't included in that policy and don't feel like they can come to the forefront with things they need help with and so I want to make sure that there's, there's that space for them even if they haven't come forward yet. Um, and then the last sort of tenet for weight is education. Um, I find that our, because our campus, majority of our campus comes from such a, a heteronormative white cultural background, they have zero education on the queer community and so um, as a student leader I find it's important to not just advocate or represent students but to also educate the straights <laughs> um, because a lot of hate and a lot of exclusion comes from a lack of education. You know, a lack of understanding that um, the queer community is not a new fad. It's not something that just popped up, as my grandfather likes to say. Um, it's been around for, for generations, for decades, for centuries. Um, I, I had a, a project I did last year where I pointed out that in the Hindu community, non-binary individuals have been around for generations. They're actually revered. And so pointing that out and pointing out like queer visibility in the past, it's an educational tenet for, for students to find out that there's no reason they should be exclusionary. You know, everybody has deserves that space. So yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, does it? Okay. Um so on answering the question, the CPUT community mostly, um they are from black, poor backgrounds, whereby most of the students are coming from places whereby they, they were grew with patriarchy. So the patriarchy really influ influenced um, even their um, social norms, how they live at res. So how we deal with the situation, we, because we just um, been recently formed as a student formation, we, we saw um, a very rising range in most of um, people who are really um, abused um, or when queers are violated in their rooms, they get to seek um, 
a woman friend and get to raise the, the issue. So really getting to have a relationship with a woman, with a woman, there is a sense of feminism that they understand in the community. It's just that there is no education because understanding our our course, our courses and our backgrounds, we don't get to get a sense of being emotional on issues. Being emotional um, in our school, it, it, it's considered as not being strong. Um, we have a lot of toxic um, traits of masculinity. Um, on, 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 on queers, okay, let me refrain. On, on queers, mostly what we've seen, um, especially those who are placed with straight people, they are really abused. Um, but what I've seen is that the dean, um, when we report the situation, it gets tackled very quickly. It's just that there is no framework within um, the disciplinary committees in to, to, to regulate um, the, the, the acts um, and also the students. Um, also the GBV cases, understanding um, the institution itself I made an example um, on previous um, discussions when we were having discussions with them. That first thing, um, we have less capacity of shuttles. And then we understand we have women, we have men. When we enter shuttles, men are going to overpower women because of the, 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 the masculinity that they are having. Violence doesn't only start in um, in the GBV, but it starts where it, it starts um, at the violent itself. So our community is really influenced by. Um, I want I want us to 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 Africanize feminism so that in our institution we can we can we can have. I've been trying to think about um, this feminism. How can we move um, the feminism from the colonial? Um, aspect to, mm. to, to the in institution itself. Mm. And I, 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 I came with a solution myself on saying, if we can localize feminism and Africanize feminism, we can change the toxic culture which is really happening in our institution. We have written documents, I write documents a lot um, on, 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 on situations which are really happening on daily operations, I go to, um, I call a lot of, um, of a lot of formation, there's a little about to, we get to be in collaborations with other organizations to come and have program to destigmatize the culture which we are having because the culture, you can even see it's very, you can see students when they are very exploited, um, they become frustrated. When they become frustrated, they are now going to act. And our role as, um, as activists is to be voice of the voiceless. It's just that from the other aspects of um, management, they will see us as we are being problematic. We are being, um, that's where we are going to be criminalized. That's when we are going to be isolated and identified that, no, this one speaks a lot. Um, when I get to ra raise questions of saying, no, why don't um, binary community, um, non-binary communities have their own residences? So from a capitalist um, view, you get to make the university spend a lot of money. And if you raise out issues, we are going to be um, identified, isolated, and be dealt with. So that's um, how our spaces are. Um, it's fine. I think my voice is deep enough. Um, can everyone hear me? Thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap it up um, in, 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 in three aspects. Um, first one being the issues the needs of the students and the way forward. Um, some of the issues to highlight some lived experiences, I remember in my first year I was in a male residence. Um, I had this roommate from Limpompo and when he walked into the room, I was already um, allocated this room. So when he walked into the room, he saw this boy or this whoever you saw with nail polish on their hands. And he was literally surprised, I could tell with, on his eyes. And then he invited his roommate over 
um, they kept on making noise even at night, which is they were in a form of resisting me in the space or like in a form of chasing me out in their space. And this led to them reporting me to, to the president of the residence. And I was, called, um, I was called in and they said, your roommate is moving out because he feels uncomfortable. We bring someone new to your space. And this um, sums up the frigid, fragility of, um, of heterosexualism in our spaces because it's not that um, we, 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 we are enforcing us ourselves into, 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 into existence. The main man it is equality, but heterosexualism and its fragility is resisting um, our existence in these spaces. And this is something I've realized um, in, in this, in so many spaces, in classrooms. When you sit in a classroom already, and there are people looking at you when you walk in, um, and when the activities, when, the, when they are done in residences, you can already tell um, that they do not want you in the space. And as a student leader who has served as vice chairperson of Queer As, I remember dealing with so many quick cases last year um, of, of students um, leaving these male spaces, those male residences, choosing to stay private because they, the, the, the setting and the activities, because Stellenbosch University reeks of a culture um, 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 of, of, of heterosexualism that is white, as Yedin said earlier on. They want us to run around naked in the residence, which is, I'm like, no, honeys, uh, there's no way. And they, uh, they, there's cackles, there's socialization that they do. They invite from their residences, and they force us to, 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 to socialize in a way that they're, they're, like, they're telling you, find a girlfriend. So there's an enforcement of heterosexualism to us as queer and non-binary students. So those are, the, those are some of the issues that we are facing with. And I remember there was a trans student in a residence called Valkhanov um, at this institution. Um, they, they, they teased him. And every time when they, when they walked in, um, in, 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 the, in the cafeteria, they would tease them. And that um, led us to, 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 to mobilize and and hit the ground because that's what I'm about. When there's an issue, let's hit the ground, let's talk about it. And immediately when we hit the ground, we raised all these issues with the rectorate of the institution. When we were walking back at night to our residences, there was a car moving around the campus, throwing eggs at us uh, because we are this colorful and prideful community that they feel um, is enforcing themselves to the heterosexual community, or they want to break um, heterosexualism, of which um, um, that's the issue we deal with. Um, so we, 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 we quite a community that is faced by gruesome and a scourge of a negative response um, from, um, from fragile masculinity and fragile femininity because that's one thing we, also, we should also talk about. There are feminists who are so against um, 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 trans and gender diverse inclusion in our spaces. Um, so the needs for students is, is, is a space where we can all exist in the basis of humanity. Um, it's something that we've been longing for. It's something that I've seen also in my leadership experience that we really need to be seen, to be validated, for our voices to be heard, because all of us, our voices equate our freedom. But when that freedom is stripped away from you as a student, as an institution, um, how, how am I going to grow to be an active citizen in this country when every time I'm reminded that you are not supposed to be here? Where am I supposed to be? Bring the table that I'm supposed to sit at. If you say, if you're telling me constantly, your actions are telling me you're not supposed to be here. So those are the kind of issues and students need um, that, that, that their existence to be validated. We need equality as a basis of all the existence that we see in our institutions. Um, and we ended up being dissonant. Even though there's, there are these um, queer arts groups, um, all these movements, but we ended up being dissonant. We found home on each other and not on the rest of the society. So it's more like now there's this community and there's that community. And how they label us is we labeled as the angry community. Don't listen to the queers, they are always angry. <laughs> that's, what we, that's how we are labeled mm -hmm. as, oh, don't listen to that one. Because they are always angry. And that's one of the issues that are, are wreaking in our institution. And way forward for me, I think, um, Part of the issues, they start with the student leaders themselves. Mm -hmm.
because you feel like sometimes when you enter the space as a student leader, a queer student leader like myself, they're like, oh God, there comes trouble. You understand? Mm -hmm. Of which that's what I'm about to trouble the space. Um, so I think a way forward is to dismantle the mindset. And that is through the SOGS training that Gender Dynamics does um, with various institutions. I think it's high time we bring that to all institutions to, to universalize that um, training so that we dismantle it from top down. Because we can already see that the power comes from top. How those student leaders influence and they, they, they bring about this culture into these residences. Let's start with them because the trouble starts there. When we dismantle their thinking, their mindsets, we are channeling ourselves through a better society because we are navigating and, um, and, and also and unpacking what it means to be a human and what it means to be a student leader. Because when you come and enforce your ideas to me, you are not a student leader. You understand? Um, and also, we need to visibilize. And this is through um, um, discussions as student leaders and also student community. We need to bring... Um, um, <laughs> sorry, um, I know I'm taking time. I'm going to wrap up now. Um, and also... Inclusion in the terms of the curriculum. Um, I think the model policy framework is going to be a crucial aspect. And thank you, Yadin, for raising this aspect. I think now personally, I'm taking it to the transformation office itself. I'm not taking it to the quality. I'm taking it to the umbrella of all the offices, so that it comes from the top down approach because I've seen how we've normalized the top down approach. So let me take it to the top so that we can implement it in curriculum and in all other aspects of our, of our institution to ensure that we have a safe space where we can enjoy and I can be proud when I leave the institution that I, say, that I can say I'm an alumni of that institution, proudly so. You have one minute. <laughs> yeah, um, which is great because I usually hate public speaking, so I'll just try to keep it a bit brief. So with me, as a member of the queer community and as a student leader who serves the queer community at UCT, I think the main thing that stands out to me is the diversity. Like UCT has students from all over the world. I don't think I have one class or even one tutorial or group that doesn't have someone that's an international student. But we have students that come from every background you can imagine. And something that stood out to me recently is um, that someone from star sports, uh, different sports teams usually have like committees. So they have like um, confirmation committees and like outreach committees. Uh, so someone reached out to me from one of the martial arts schools and they're saying that as part of their outreach, they want to try and reach the community, reach as many diverse people as possible. So they actually wanted to do a self-defense workshop with us, which I think is great to hear from sports that they're actually wanting to get involved with career students. They're wanting to have community all together and to feel empowered. So I think UCT's community and the change that can happen for queer students really starts with the students and students engaging with each other. Like you saw in the video, like the community here is very much like, if we want something, we're going to ask each other, we're going to keep bugging each other, we try to hold each other accountable, we try to help each other, and the community, I think it's just so important to just lift each other up and just keep pushing that, that we just got to keep lifting each other up. Okay, cool. Timing? <laughs> Nothing about us without us. <laughs> so just to end off, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists and for all of the leadership positions that you hold. Could I invite the speakers, uh, of the panelists to the front, please? Um, and we're going to try to do our best to keep it within a 20-minute time limit <laughs> so that we can enjoy the declaration process with you and the GDS team. Thank you, colleagues. Hi. Um, thanks, first of all, for inviting me, Gender Dynamics, and your organization. Um, I'm Simon Pixton taylor I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, somewhere on the spectrum, but using he, him pronouns. And um, 
I basically have a special interest in helping young people with gender diversity and started um, the Gender Identity Development Service uh, in 2012 at Red Cross, which is also part of UCT, where I'm an honorary senior lecturer in the psychiatry department, based on I do all the teaching for the registrars, and um, I'm a traveling circus. I give a huge <laughs> amount of talks on transgender, 101 on transgender, to all sorts of people. So thanks for inviting me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you've already briefly met me. I'm Kanisela Phillips, and I'm on the panel representing Gender Dynamics and its work, um, hopefully contributing indelibly so to this conversation. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I am Jessica Johannesson. I am a social work lecturer at Hechnoite College. I um, have worked with gender dynamics a couple of times uh, because not much is happening at Hechnoite College. Um, so this is a, a, a personal thing for me um, because I have various family members that are part of the LGBTQIA community. Um, and have seen the struggles that they have been through. Um, so it's very, very close to my heart. And when I attend things like this, it's, I still want to tear up uh, um, because of the, the personal thing. Um, but I'm a social worker, and social workers fight for social justice. Uh, um, and so that's what I'm trying to do now at Hechenota College. When I, when I think of quality and I think of learning, um, I immediately, as a social worker from my lens, I think um, Maslow before Bloom. Um, that's immediately what comes to my mind. And we know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if the bottom and the basic needs are not being met by students, they cannot learn. And I think safety is a big thing here. Um, especially in a, in a discussion that we're having today with, with trans persons um, and anyone that's part of the LGBTQIA community, safety is a very, very big issue. So I think within our organization, um, we do not have any policies. So, um, we have a discrimination policy that is very, very brief and yeah, not detailed at all. Um, and for the first time, um, at the end of March, we, um, we collaborated with Gender Dynamics um, and Norsa Community Care in the Wellington area, as well as Stellenbosch University, where we made history, and uh, kind of laughed at me, but I was so excited in my tutu and my ally t-shirt, and I was like, we're making history today! Um, where we, we honestly had a first of its kind at Hichenote College where we created awareness. Uh, and what came out there for me is, um, from the evaluation, is that students felt listened to, heard, and seen, and how important that is in learning, in feeling safe. Um, and I think policy is important in terms of making sure, I mean, we've heard today that it's all good and well to have policy, um, but it needs to be implemented. But we need to start with the policy. There needs to be a policy. So I think that that's, that's important. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. I think for me, it is the notes that I've made um, on my side. It is really to understand that education is a complex system. Um, that is embedded in political, in cultural, um, and economic contexts. That is really to understand. So for policymakers, those who are, um, you know, spearheading transformation, even the community that, that we are discussing today and that we are supporting with this model policy framework, it's to understand that education is a very complex system. Um, I, I mentioned that it is a microcosm of the broader community. Um, and so I think it's important to keep in mind that um, education's uh, systemic nature, um, because if we, if we forget that, then we are forever going to run in circles. Um, education in and of itself, the ed higher education, um, was never designed with you know, gender and sexual minorities <coughs> in mind. And so I think it's that understanding that needs to happen. Um, but also to understand that the dimensions in higher education are inter interdependent, they are influencing one another in ways that are sometimes even unforeseeable. And we've, we've witnessed that within this specific institution. 
on a number of occasions. Um, Liberty mentioned that uh, the reason why we partnered and how we ca the partnership came about with UCT was really around you know some flames that needed to be put out, I guess, um, and, I'm, and I'm using that lightly. Um, it was with regards to the, the conversation that was had uh, with, the, with the VC and the, the urologist. Um, and so really I think it's understanding um, how, how these things can happen and be unforeseen at, um, at, at in various um, systems. So I think also that the higher education system um, must understand that it works with people before imparting knowledge, before education, before achieving a qualification. We are working with people. And I think also um, that uh, before beginning formal education, um, children can be greatly influenced. Um, and here we see that there's a backlash, the global anti-gender movement that is uh, seeking to, dis to, to domesticate itself in South Africa and has uh, domesticated itself in Africa, a certain African state. And so I think really in terms of the global agenda of you know, Sustainable Development Goal 4, I think really it's, it's, it's understanding that uh, many elements go into making quality um, people because be beyond making a quality academics and quality students, I think it's understanding that these are people, again, that we are working with, that is quality, um, including health, include, including early childhood experiences and um, the home support that might be available or not be available. So if we understand people in the entirety that is occupying the space, then we'll be able to deliver quality education in that sense. Okay, well... Um, I don't fully feel that I'm qualified to talk on behalf of UCT, although I went there many years ago. I'm not employed by them, but I am an outsider who comes in contact with UCT. And in general, you know, I think today's kind of the first step of a policy, and it's been really refreshing and wonderful to listen to all this work that Gender Dynamics has done. And I think we have to acknowledge we're all allies in this room. You know, nobody is sitting here getting angry or upset about these guidelines. Uh, but equally, we have a massive problem going on. We're all the lucky people sitting in this room. You know, even if you're transgender, the fact that you're sitting here, that you're alive, that you're not beaten up, I mean, maybe you were in the past, but we're all kind of survivors in some way, most of us, if we've got gender diversity or something. And um, so I think the first cornerstone is policy, but the next one is education. And, um, and really, Absolutely, everybody needs to be educated, and I think it can't be underestimated that if the people at the top, and I don't like talking like that because it's we all want to be equal, but the fact is, if the people at the top are not understanding the issues and the needs, nothing happens. So basically with children, I work with kids up to 18, I also see you know adults as well, but um, when we do a social transition in a school, the first person I call is the principal. Because I can tell you, if the principal's not on board, I'm wasting my time trying to get a social transition. And I phone the principal and I say, well, you know, I'm so-and-so from Red Cross, you've got a pupil that needs a social transition. Um, have you had one before? No. What does this mean? And I say the five things, and they're horrified. One thought I was asking him to get on the stage in a bikini. You know, <laughs> they really are terrified. And then I say, well, you know what? I'd really like to help you with this process and give a talk to you and all the teaching staff. And that's Gender 101. And it has to start there. Because, you know, in 1994, nobody addressed racism in this country. You know, and I'm not blaming anyone for that, but nobody addressed racism. And today, you don't have to address, for instance, a gay kid, but the fact is gender is a big issue. And you can avoid trauma to all those kids if you educate people. All it takes is one talk, one hour, and we have over 64 schools in the Western Cape who've had social transitions. Not one episode of bullying in any of them. 
Now those are the schools where Ron Adenal or myself has gone in, and I'm not saying you haven't also done your work, including Wellington, Jochenoote, and we have rolled out a program where it's education and it starts with the teachers, and then we help them know what to say to the, um, the parents next, and then to the students, um, which is actually relatively simple. There are ways, and, and we don't give the talk, and it's very simple, and I can tell you about social transitions later. But as far as UCT or any other institution is, this is exactly the same thing. I mean, I have to admit, I have, and I've shared my reluctance about even being here today, because UCT is very good at window dressing. You know, they pay some money, they get together all you nice people that know about transgender, and they give you a, a food and lots of nice cameras that they're going to use in their brochures to say how wonderfully transformed UCT is. And I can tell you, one of the most senior people who, um, and one of our worst problems stem from UCT. Of you probably read about the doctor who um, supported uh, talk therapies to change gender in children. That was a trainee at UCT finishing psychiatry. Now what, and as a result of that person in a Western Cape education department, I'm pretty convinced since that happened, instead of UCT coming out full force from the top down, saying this is outrageous and taking appropriate action, you know, I'm not prepared to mince my words. They can get rid of me if they want to. <laughs> but I am the transgender clinic. Nobody, there is no funding for transgender youth. I have volunteered for 12 years to run that clinic. And I'm not saying that for sympathy, but that's the reality on the ground, is UCT does lip service. This is the first of a very important step of guidelines, and we're very grateful for you for all the work you've done to ensure that this has taken place. But we all need to push for the next step, which is education from the top down. Don't start with it, start everywhere with students, but it has to be everywhere. Sorry for talking so long. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, is Ubuntu, right? Is That's the bottom line. When we enter these institutions, we come being human. And I think that quality education has got to do, first and foremost, embrace the fact that we are human. It doesn't matter whether the human that I am is understandable to you or it is not. And I think for me that is a fundamental, um, fundamentally important aspect of quality education. And, and the word quality in the SDGs for me is very, very critical because it takes us to a place where we are able to distinguish between quantity education and quality education. And for me it speaks to things like we are not just machines that are entering these institutions to come and learn. At the beginning, I really liked your introduction. When we come to these places, these are sites of struggle. These are sites of power. And we come being complex. We know that. We come being different. But we also come being you know, uh, 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 autonomous in a sense that we self-determine that which we call human. And I think institutions, um, have got to realize that quality education needs to embrace all of that. So it's not just about teaching psychiatry, it's not just about teaching mathematics, but it's also understanding the bodies that are sitting in this space, the people, the humans, and part of those humans are, of course, of course all of what we are here. And it's fluid and it changes and varied all the time. And we cannot box it, and I think that's very, very clear. For me, quality education has got to really at the basic level begin by not even questioning our humanity because when you start asking who are you when you start about worrying about how i have sex who i choose to have sex with how i choose to dress how i choose to name myself then you really um fundamentally violating the very component of what we call quality education. When we enter institutions, that should not be even a question, right? It should not even be a question. The question should be, how do we make sure that we unlearn the oppressions that have co 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 constructed all these complex yeah. complexities or violations that we're sitting with? And I think for me that is, that is what is at the center of what the SDG4 is about. Quality education is unlearning also 
these oppressions uh, of slavery, of colonization, yeah. and apartheid that have, um, have, through education, by the way, through education, have indoctrinated mm -hmm. systems of what we call gender, systems of what we call sexuality, even yeah. systems of what we call human, in such a way that those of us who don't fit those boxes continue to be alienated in the ways that we have all experienced uh, and, and listen to yeah. here today. And many of us, I'm queer by the way myself, right? And, and I'm talking about things that I know, things that I experience on a daily basis. Even in this work, just coming to UWC, one of the things was a, a form that I was given to complete as a staff member. And the form says male, female. And my question was, I do not fit in any of this, right? And this is 2023. So these are the things that we're talking about to say then, when we enter these institutions, the conversation is still at that level where you still have to explain yourself. We carry the burden even before we enter the classroom, even before we enter the space of what we call teaching and learning, uh, research, and, and all the co-work that we do. So that's problematic, and quality education has got to take us away from that place. So I think I think what was really useful from this from the panel discussion is is obviously firstly a, a humanizing praxis, yeah. how we receive our students in class, yeah. but then. What Simon and, and Dr. Mulakazi have, have indicated is also the content that is being taught. Yeah. What are we teaching in our classrooms to produce fantastic social workers or the next co competent graduate? How, what are we doing in the classroom space to change the curriculum so that we don't have a repeat action of yes. Deval? Um, and also leadership. How do we tra train leadership and their competencies? I do want to share, though, that the, the research that I conducted within some of the universities shows that change, particularly for LGBTI and MSM, doesn't come from the top. That the same output and at same output and same um, inclusion level of inclusion can be ground up, can be achieved ground up. And I, and so I don't want to, us to hang our hats on top down approaches only because the power is actually within each of you to create the change that you want. And I want to say the change, the changes that you see around gender neutral bathrooms and the pronouns, that came through discussions and advocacy from Rainbow UCT back in 2014 to date. And if it wasn't for the conversations and us knocking on doors from student societies, staff members that had power, were knocking on the doors with us, we, you wouldn't see what we have today. So yes, there's challenges in UCT, we own them, but, but we, it takes everybody, not just leadership. I want to, to ask um, okay. one more question in the five minutes remaining, and that is, um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> policy, <laughs> policy is often as strong as the resources and the capacity um, and people available to implement it. And in South Africa's highly financially constrained higher education environment, what would be the top two priorities that tertiary, that the tertiary sector could commit to? I do think we need to work absolutely from the bottom up and I think Freshers Week should be addressing, not just it should be addressing racism, sexism and transphobia and all these things. There are times that we have when students are new and it should be at that stage that instead of just having parties and getting drunk or whatever these students, what they used to do in my day, I might be naive today, but these should be... Sorry. <laughs> Okay, but it was a very long time ago. I don't hardly remember, but uh, basically I do think that any person joining a university should, in our country, with so many crucial factors that do have this intersectionality, they need to learn them. And I hadn't heard um, the, the male fragility, cisgendered male fragility, but I mean it is a beautiful description because we used to what white uh, fragility. Um, but anyway, those sort of issues need to be addressed with the first years and we need to go in at the top. <laughs> no, definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simon. I th think I'm also going to say that um, for institutions of higher learning to come on board and adopt 
model, model policy framework such as this one um, in then assisting and supporting that uh, agenda that, the, that the, the institution is of course mandated to, to roll out. But I think it's also to say that there's this um, overly, you know, kind of like buzzword of trans transformation has become a, a buzzword within institutions of higher learning. But we find that there's a heavy leaning towards racial justice and racial equity. Um, where we find that trans and gender diverse persons are nowhere to be seen within senior positions within the institution. Um, I remember putting this panel together and I, I was trying to get a, you know, someone from the transformation office or uh, an academic from, from an institution and it was quite difficult for me to do so. This is why Gender Dynamics is doing a second research study on why trans and gender diverse persons are not graduating from higher education institutions in the country. And so we really want to understand the factors that is impeding access to education, but also what is the, the lived experience within the institution why we have such high dropout levels within the community. Um, and so I think, again, we're looking at it through an intersectional lens, but um, I had to choose two, so those were my two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can say that there are, there's a lack of resources, there's no money. Um, but if I have a look at what we were able to put together in two weeks at Hechenwetter College, I was amazed. Uh, um, so there are resources. People are willing to collaborate. Uh, people are willing to do this. And you can do it really quickly with no money. Yeah. Um, we did it with no money and yeah. somehow money came. <laughs> so, so things can happen. And I think we must be careful of getting stuck on that, getting stuck on this top-down approach because it has to start at the bottom. It's not going to, it's not going to happen from the top. If I look at my institution, um, we have, it's a white male management team. It's not going to come from there. Um, but I think the, the, the challenge that we have at our institution is mobilizing our students. Uh, um, our students do not have the confidence uh, to make their voices known. They have opinions. They are our future leaders, but they are scared. Um, so I think that mobilizing our students so that we can have this uh, bottom-up approach, uh, because that is how, how things will change, and then making sure that we start fighting for. I mean, you heard at that session how excited the students were. Um, the, when the Stellenbosch students were talking about make your voices known, the, our students were encouraged and I hope that in the new term that they'll come with that, with that energy where they can make their voices heard because it needs to come from the bottom because it's not going to come from the top. Huh? So with that, thank you very much to the panelists and for your input and I think we've, we've at least got some nuggets of wisdom that we can walk away with mostly being let's embed it in the right places so that leadership has to listen and let's collaborate more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I just want to take over from just going going into the thanks that we that we want to say to each and every person that made it a priority to come and support your dynamics in the work that we are doing uh, towards the inclusion of the purposeful inclusion of trans and gender diverse persons. Um, and so what we are going to do at is the end, and thank you also for your, um, your patience with us today. Um, we did start a little late, uh, some speakers did arrive a little late, um, <laughs> but we, 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 we thank you for, for just coming and bringing your great minds to the space, for bringing your activism, your student advocacy to this space and I think really this will call for further unpacking. As we're moving out, we'll, we'll place um, our hand in the paint and just place it onto the banner, the model policy framework banner.